has been roughly eight years since my father was exil exiled from our family home and vacated my life. Most days I can look at him from a distance, more closely even, more fairly than when he held me hostage in the house, roaming the passages throughout the night, at once protecting us from danger and inducing our nightmares. Except for the times when I see him when I look in the mirror, the distance has made me view him as if neatly framed and mounted on the dense white walls of my cranium, as the portrait of a post-apartheid black South African man. I say black because my father would have never identified as colored. The Molotov of toxic masculinity meets PTSD and broken dreams. Now with insight into the intersections of trauma, untreated mental illness, and unfettered ego, I can read him as a splayed out, bloated, unwashed Vitruvian man. No longer the foggy chimera of my childhood, the creature that lurked at the back of the house and would come out every now and again in various grotesque forms. So I try and fill in the gaps, piecing the skeleton of my personal history together with broken evidence, like an archeologist who from the safe distance that time allows can cast the bones of the prehistoric creature, no longer terrifying, but even then, when relics and fossils are lovingly and painstakingly pieced together and studied, the theories we build around these can be vulnerable to conjecture, and we curate the museums of our past with willful subjectivity. A few months ago, Sarah and I had the privilege of going to a conference in London, and I wanted to hate this trip to the colonial motherland, but in spite of myself, the fucking behemoth of a city charmed me with its chic gloom and edgy, ubiquitous art. With the pound exerting its tyrannical weight over the feeble rand, we aim for as many free activities as possible. Luckily, there are incredible museums. We try to avoid those that we knew for sure were filled with stolen things, which cut out about three quarters of them. Um, and around the time we were there, Sarah showed me an article about how leadership from the Easter Islands had traveled to visit the leadership of the Victorian Albert Museum, to urgently appeal for the return of an eight-foot basalt Maui statue, colloquially known as Lost or Stolen Friend. Maui statues are defined as the living faces of deified ancestors. The governor of Easter Island responded to this capture and display of his ancestry with a plea, you have our soul. This line, you have our soul, was the headline of the newspaper article. In response to this, the Victorian Albert Museum agreed to possibly maybe loan the statue back to the islanders. <laughs> to avoid complicity in this hubristic display of inhumanity and armed with the knowledge that in most museums there are trophy bones, even if not on display, they are the frontal lobes from skulls prized open for all the brain mad and thoughts and dreams and memories to spill out. They are the eyeballs and sex organs, reveries, histories, and desires of the vast and various indigenous people hidden and pickled in boxes and jars in museum basements. So we stayed away from history. Instead, we flocked to the modern art exhibitions. These are safer to visit as a colonial subject abroad, although not necessarily safe for women, considering the predatory nature of many, many modern artists. So the Natural History Museum, which we hoped housed only the bones of long dead animals, was a safe bet. The entrance to the museum boasts the shell of a massive Brachiosaurus, safely enclosed behind a glass cage. Just a few paces on, there's the majestic framework of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, 